When I bought my Miranda Auto Max 3, it came as part of a job lot of cameras, and in that job lot was this Topcon IC1 Auto, which I rather liked the look of. So not long after I'd repaired the Miranda, I took a look at the Topcon. It was missing the battery cover, but when I inserted some batteries and completed the circuit with a screwdriver, the shutter fired as it should at all speeds. I made myself a temporary battery cover, which did the trick, but I also ordered another batch of camera bodies, including another IC1 Auto, complete with its battery cover. More about this one later. The IC1 Auto was first released somewhere around 1973, with a second version coming out around 1976. Rather handily, my spare parts body is version 1, and my good copy is version 2, so we can take a look at the differences. Version 1 has the word auto in black, whereas version 2 has it in red. The exposure compensation dial on version 1 only goes down to f2, whereas on version 2 it goes down to f1.8. Version 1 has a cold shoe with no electrical connection, whereas version 2 has a hot shoe. And possibly most importantly, they added a green LED battery check indicator in the top of the viewfinder. This illuminates when you half press the shutter button. If the batteries are dead, or the connection is bad, the shutter appears to fire, but both curtains are released at the same time, so the film isn't exposed at all. You could, theoretically, happily shoot a roll of film completely unaware of the fact that your photos would be blank. You can, of course, move your hand in front of the lens to see the exposure meter needle moving, which would also indicate that there was life in the battery. And talking of batteries, the IC1 uses two PX675 batteries. These were the old Mercury batteries, which are no longer available, so I used two 675 Zinc Air hearing aid batteries, which are about the right voltage. The lens mount on the IC1 is the Topcon UV bayonet, as opposed to the earlier RE cameras, which I believe used the Exacta bayonet. From what I can make out, if your lens says UV top core or high top core, it'll fit the IC1. The IC part of the name refers to the IC, or integrated circuit, that's used to control the shutter timing rather than a purely mechanical system as on older cameras. There wasn't too much wrong with my IC1 and I was keen to try it out, so I only fixed what was necessary, rather than giving it a full service. The lens needed a complete clean of the optics, and the focusing helicoid re-greasing. My camera came with the bottom of the range f2.8 lens, but that's fine for what I'll be using it for. The viewfinder optics also needed cleaning, so the prism needed to come out. Not too tricky on this camera, because there isn't so much wiring in the way. And the control rings for the aperture and shutter needed to be cleaned and re-lubed with dry molly paste, because they were gritty and tight. I've got a film in my good IC1 at the moment, so I'll use the earlier spare parts camera for demonstration purposes. When this one arrived, the shutter didn't work, even when you put batteries in it. This turned out to be just a bad connection, and now it works as it should. More significantly, the mirror was rattling around in the body with a chip out of its corner. Rather handily, other than the chip, which was still attached to the back plate, the mirror was in good condition, so I was able to clean off the old glue and re-glue the mirror in position, so I now have two working IC1s. The lenses for this camera only have a focusing ring, the aperture ring being located on the camera body. It makes converting them to digital that bit more difficult, but not impossible by any means. The aperture ring goes all the way down to the minimum of f2 on the early camera and f1.8 on the later one. But if you're using something like this 28mm f4 lens, you have to remember that it's an f4 lens, because you can still set the ring down to f2 even though the lens can't achieve f2. At the other end of the ring is the auto position, and now the camera is in shutter priority auto exposure mode. Assuming your exposure meter works, and is accurate, you can snap away simply adjusting the shutter speed and the camera will select the appropriate aperture. To release the ring from the auto position, there's a little release button on the side here. And now we're back in full manual mode. 
Another thing you need to remember when you're swapping lenses is to set the exposure compensation dial to match the lens you're attaching, because the camera has no other way of knowing what lens you've attached, and the exposures will be off if you don't set it correctly. This is only relevant if you're using the internal meter. I tend to use the camera in full manual mode with an external meter, so that setting isn't so important to me. Behind the aperture ring is the shutter speed ring, with speeds ranging from 1 second to 1 500th of a second, and there's the usual bulb setting too. Flash sync is marked in red at 1 60th of a second for electronic flash, and you'd use 1 15th of a second or slower for the old Class M flash bulbs. There's a flash sync socket to the right of the lens, as viewed from the front of the camera. The film advancing lever and shutter button work in the same way as any other camera, so there's not much to show there, although the advancing lever does have that small degree of slop, allowing easy access when in use, and then you can retract it out of the way the rest of the time. The rewind crank doubles up as the film door release, and I definitely need to make sure I open the correct camera here, I don't want a disaster with the roll of colour film in the newer version. I haven't replaced the light seals yet in this one, so it's looking a bit grubby here from the decomposed foam. The drive release button is on the bottom of the camera, which you press before rewinding the film. The exposure counter is situated beside the shutter button and advancing lever, and as you'd expect, it auto-resets when you open the back of the camera. Looking through the viewfinder, you've got a microprism centre focusing circle, with a fine focusing ring outside that, and the exposure meter is nice and clear on the left hand side. Just playing with the camera, it felt right in my hands, so the next thing was to put a roll of film in it. I'd got plenty of black and white in stock, but along with the spare parts IC1 was this Practica Super TL1000, which was jammed solid. You couldn't advance the film, or release the shutter. You couldn't even lift the rewind lever to open the back of the camera. But simply pressing the drive release button on the bottom freed everything up, and upon inspection, someone had installed a film with the canister exit pointing upwards, rather than in the direction of film travel. They then closed the back and tugged on the film advancing lever, putting so much tension on the film that it even stopped the rewind lever from pulling out. The loaded film should, of course, have looked something like this. That left me with an unused roll of outdated Kodak Gold 200 to try out. There's a rule of thumb that you overexpose by one stop for every 10 years that the film is out of date. So I guesstimated at the film being 20 years old, and set my exposure meter to 50 ISO and installed it in the IC1. Having seen the negatives, I don't think the film was quite that old, and I could probably have got away with only one stop of overexposure, but it worked fine anyway. Anyway, it's now time to look at the results. I usually put one roll of film through a camera and wait to see the results before using another film, in case there are any issues that I hadn't spotted, but in this case I was enjoying using the camera so much that I just bunged another roll of film in it, which was a bit of a mistake, because it turns out that the shutter is dragging a little bit, which you can see as a darker band on the right hand side of some of the shots. It's not too serious, and I'll just strip the camera down for a complete service once I've finished the current roll of film. As for the outdated film, it's probably at the sweet spot of outdatedness, not too far gone that the shots look terrible, but you've got patches of odd colours where the emulsion is breaking down, and the colours are generally a bit subdued, with the exception of orange, which seems to pop as if I've tweaked things to desaturate the rest of the colours. It's got a great vintage vibe that I really like. The way the 50mm f2.8 lens renders the outer focus areas is a bit unusual. At times it looks more like camera shake than outer focus blur, but the subject is still sharp. One day I'll make an adapter to try the lens on a digital camera, it'll be interesting to see how it performs. Everything you'll see in this video was shot on the 50 because I hadn't got the 28mm at the time. Anyway, I'll now stick on a bit of background music and roll the rest of the shots, before summarising. 
As always, these are just shots that I've taken while I've been out and about. There aren't going to be any masterpieces in there. It's all about the enjoyment of using vintage cameras to shoot film. You can probably tell that I really like this camera. It's simple to use and unpretentious. They're not too expensive to buy, and probably the only downside is the relative lack of lenses. The 50mm lenses pop up all the time, but other focal lengths can take a little more finding for a decent price. As for the outdated Kodak Gold film, well that was fantastic. I wish I could get some more rolls exactly like that. But with outdated film it can be a bit of a gamble, so I wouldn't want to pay too much for any rolls. I think that more or less covers it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel. Not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. I've fixed quite a bundle of cameras recently, so there will be more videos like this coming soon. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.